Abstraction barriers allow us to choose and even to change our representation of data. So what is data? Well, data is actually not what you think. It's not just information, but it's information that behaves a certain way. So what we need to do in order to create an abstract data type is to guarantee that the constructor and selector functions will work together to specify the right behavior. So for instance, if I want to represent rational numbers as data, I need to guarantee this behavior condition that if I construct a rational number x from a numerator n and a denominator d, then it really needs to be the case that dividing the number of x by the denominator of x equals what you'd get if you divided n by d. That means that the rational number really behaves like a rational number. An abstract data type is actually just some collection of selectors and constructors, together with some behavior conditions. That's all it takes to define new types of data. If the behavior conditions are met, then the representation is valid. So the story I'm trying to tell you here is that you can recognize an abstract data type by its behavior, not by the class that you get when you use the type function to figure out what some value is. Now, those classes are certainly going to be related to abstract data types, and we'll discover that relation soon. But one thing to appreciate is that the idea of data abstraction isn't tied to any particular feature of the Python language or any programming language in general. You can do it with any programming language using just functions alone. And what you're doing is specifying relationships between constructor and selector functions. So let's try another example. What's the behavior conditions of a pair? The pair was the thing that I used in order to bind two values together. And we used it to implement our rational number abstract data type. And we started out by using a two element list. But is that the only way to make pairs of values? The answer is no. All we need are constructors, selectors, and behavior conditions in order to represent pairs. So if a pair P was constructed from elements x and y, then selecting the zeroth element of P should return x, and selecting the first element should return y. That's all we need in order to create a pair. In the case of a pair, the selectors are the inverse of the constructors. We're guaranteed to get out what we put in. And that's generally true of what are called container types. So a pair contains two, two other values. Now, rational numbers were a little bit different. They're not containers because they might do things like reduce fractions to lowest terms. So given that we have these behavior conditions of a pair, let's see if we can build up an implementation. So I need to define pair, which takes some x and y. And it returns a pair containing x and y. And then I need a function that will select out of a pair p some element at index i where i is 0 or 1. So that returns the ith element of pair p. Then I should be able to do things like create a point, which is a pair of the x coordinate 3 and the y coordinate 4, let's say. And then I might do something like select from this point the first element, element at index 1. So I've defined a constructor and a selector. The only problem is I don't have an implementation yet. Well, we tried lists already. Let's try something else. Let's try to use functions to represent pairs. What does that mean? Well, that means I could just define a new function get the index, which is going to check if index is 0. And if so, it will return x. Otherwise, if the index is 1, it will return y. And if it's not 0 or 1, something's gone wrong. Let's not worry about that for now. What is important 
is that we now have an implementation of a pair that just creates some function and returns it. Now in order to make this a valid representation of a pair, we need the selector function to take in the kind of thing that pair returns and be able to select the ith element from it. So I can complete this implementation by returning the result of calling the functional pair p on the index i which will then return x or y. So let's see what we've done so far. I have a pair constructor. Now I used uh, point equals pair 3, 4 in order to create a pair. So this is a pair. It doesn't look much like a pair, but it behaves like a pair. Because if I select from that point the zeroth element, I get 3. And the first element, I get 4. And if I create a pair out of 5 and 6, and then I select the zeroth element of that, I'll get the 5 back. So in this way, I can bundle together values and I can split them apart just by using functions alone. I don't need the built-in list type in order to create a pair. So this is what we call the functional pair implementation. We have a definition of a higher order function and the function within it represents a pair. The selector function doesn't really have much logic in it at all. It just defers the actual selecting of x or y to the object p itself. Now we can quickly look at what happens when we call the pair function to construct a new pair. We create a new frame where x is bound to 2 and y is bound to 4. And then we create a new function and return it. And this function is the pair. And that pair will be bound to the name point in the global frame. So now we have a point, which is a pair. That pair happens to be a function, but that's just an implementation detail. The nice thing is that we can select from that point. And how does that work? Well, we call the select function, passing in the pair and the index of the element that we want to select. It defers the selection logic to the pair itself by calling p on i and calling this function, which is this get function, whose parent is f1, creates a new frame also with the parent of f1, but with the local name index bound to 1. Now what does get do? Well, if index is 0, which it's not, it would return x. But instead, index is 1 which means it returns y. So we look here to see if y is defined. It's not, but the parent is f1, and that has y bound to 4, which is why we have a return value of 4 there, and that's how we get this 4 back out of the pair that we created. So with this much code and a somewhat complicated environment diagram, we've created a way of binding together elements using functions. Even though there's some complexity here, it doesn't matter if all you want to do is use the pair function and the select function to combine things and split them apart. It will work just as well as any other representation that obeys the behavior conditions of a pair. So if we want to use a functionally implemented pair, we just say, oh, I created a pair, I selected from it, I'm done. It doesn't matter what the implementation looks like. As long as we do not violate the abstraction barrier that we've created when defining the abstract data type pair, we don't need to know that we're manipulating higher order functions here. All we need to know is that I can build a pair and I can select its elements. This pair representation is valid.